Hello, Internet. Hello, Worldwide. And you folks here in the studio, give it a, come on, you got to clap. Woo! All right. All right. Woo! We are, thank you. Okay, okay. <laughs> now, we are driving towards the end of an amazing two days, and we sort of saved an amazing segment for the end, which is one of the things that I'm, actually, we got two segments this morning, one more, I think. I'm um, very excited about this one. We are taking your questions live from around the world to these three fine folks. So I'm going to let introduce themselves in just one second so that we can tell you some of that business advice, a business advice that you've been looking for. Um, we want to know your questions. Hashtags Creative Live. And my friend Russ over here, are you going to be feeding some of those things to me? Absolutely. That's my job. Fantastic. Fantastic. So that means I can probably sit down now? Have a seat. Okay, good. Good. Um, again, I'm Chase Jarvis. I'm the co-founder of Creative Live, uh, and I'm I'm sitting next to the blue panel. Actually, so <laughs> you, you had to wear blue to be on the panel. Blue sandwich. Uh, no, I'm gonna let these guys introduce themselves so they can say a few things, and then we'll get down to brass tacks. I am Mika Salmi. I'm the CEO of Creative Live. I'm the suit around here. That's right. <laughs> exactly. I keep the place no running. <laughs> that's it. You want a little background or no? No background. Just no, no. that's it. Okay. That's it. Cool. <laughs> Should I go, go equally short? <laughs> My name is Tim Ferriss. I write books that sound like infomercials. <laughs> four hour work week, four hour body, four hour chef. Uh, also work with a lot of startups, including Creative Live, Evernote, Uber, TaskRabbit, Stumble Mediocre upon. startups, just a couple. Yeah, yeah, a handful of very, very fun startups. Hey, and Gary? Uh, Gary Schwartz, CEO of Odesk. And Odesk is the world's largest online workplace. We enable companies to hire, manage, and pay talent from around the world. And uh, I'm working on a book, The Four Hour CEO. And I'm going <laughs> to look for Tim's help on this. So, uh, I'm that's very serious. reasonable royalty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think yeah. That, yeah, so Gary's going to ask questions to Tim for most of this panel. I exactly. Yeah. Um, no, thank you guys very much. I'm looking forward to hearing questions. that They're already starting to come in. I'm getting the wave from Russ. So. This is sort of like, is it sort of, is like sort of Shark Tank-ish or Love Line meets Creative we Live? Us. Yeah, that's how it works. <laughs> that's right. um, but fire away, let's hear it. Absolutely. So we did ask for questions from the internet uh, ahead of time, and we have a couple questions queued up. So we're going to start out with one from Mai Kong. She says, M Square Press is an online fine stationery boutique that creates one-of-a-kind treasure keepsakes and stationery to help people preserve memories on paper. Started our business in 2010. The biggest challenge we have is we do everything ourselves, like graphic design, production, customer service, shipping, bookkeeping, etc. We need to learn how to outsource some of our works to others. How do you get started when you're a one-person organization? How do you make it so that you can bring in other people? How do you move beyond that one-person organization? As the moderator of this panel, I am going to go straight to Gary on this one. <laughs> well, I might even defer to Tim because he, he <laughs> writes books about the answer it. To me. So, no, yeah. But, um, yeah, so Odesk, actually, this is what we do. So this is really teed up uh, for us. We're about enabling people to get leverage for themselves by um, saying, look, you should figure out what you're really good at and what you like doing, and everything else you should delegate to others to do. And we've created a platform that enables you to do that. You come to our platform to find the right people from around the world, to manage them as if they were in the same office, and then we handle all the payment and statutory and whatever. Um, we just ran a session on this, but some very quick tips are, you know, start small, don't try and boil the ocean, pick one or two things that you don't want to do and dip your toe in the water by having others do those. And once you get comfortable, then you can start to escalate and hand more things out. But things like customer support, uh, writing, um, you know, a anything that they're doing can be done via this online on-demand workforce. Gary, can it be affordable as well? Like, can you talk about that for a Because I think that's one of the, as a solopreneur, I started out, you know, running my own photography and director business. It was just me. I swept the floors. I answered every single email. I did all that for years and years and years. And one of my big concerns was cost. So can you find affordable help out there? Because I'm sure if this person, their business only started in 2010, we don't know what their revenues are, but... Can you be cost conscious and do this stuff? Oh, absolutely. If you think about it, you know, traditional work, how else are you going to get help with that work, right? Well, you would have to actually hire people. And if you're going to do that locally, they're more expensive, it's competitive, it's time consuming, um, you know, it's rigid, meaning you now need an office and a desk and a computer and a phone and sick time and all the things that go along with yeah. it. So just those savings alone, not to mention the fact that you're tapping into a global talent pool. There's people all over the world that are dying to work for for you. So I would say that um, it's very cost effective and uh, people are amazed. Once they try it, They, 89% of our clients say their businesses are more competitive because of online work. 
Fantastic. Like yeah, under, Ferris. Under, yeah, under, please. Underscore. Do. You're like my PE coach. Yeah. Ferris. Uh, <laughs> so. Timothy. Yes, no, okay, now, now I'm your no, social no, studies No, no, Timothy, teacher. now you're my angry mom. <laughs> uh, so I have to just underscore a couple things. The first is uh, exactly what was just said, and that is start really small. And I would actually take it a step further, and I would say uh, do a few things for fun that are very inexpensive that do not relate to your profit and loss with the, uh, in the business at all because there's too much stress associated with that. Uh, so for instance, and, and there are, there's of course Odesk, I've used Odesk, Odesk appear, appears in my first book, there's uh, there are places like Fiverr with two R's at the end, there are places like TaskDrive, places like 99designs. Choose something that is very comfortable to you in terms of cost, say anywhere from 20 to 50 to $100 upper threshold. And that could be designing a logo for a birthday party or like a graphic for God knows what, anything. And I call that no stakes practice. And, and use that as an experimentation with the process itself. That's it. And I would also say it's very important to look for reliability first and competency second. So set a really fast turnaround, a deadline in let's say 24, 48 hours and see who delivers on time, right? So I think Neil Gaiman, there's a great commencement speech called Make Good Art. Uh, by Neil Gaiman, and he says, you know, you really you can either be easy to get along with, be really good, do work on time, and you don't even have to do all three, you just have to do two. And uh, I, I think in this particular case, testing for reliability first and then competency second is very important for a business that depends on deadlines and clients and so on. Um, so that would be another recommendation that I would make. Mika Salmi as the ever-wise CEO of Creative yeah, Live. I, what are you going to add to this? I, it's I'm, already been said. But it's all been said, but I was going to say, I'm, I'm the boring guy, which is I say figure out first what you can afford. So what, what is your kind of profit margin and what can you afford and have that number in the back of your head. I think it's great to experiment first and I think the other advice about like offload the stuff that's not fun, but you need to know how much you can spend. So I think yeah. you have to be pretty smart about knowing, oh, for the next three months I have this kind of cushion and I can afford to actually do some tests and figure it out. So I think you know being smart about the numbers is, is good. Yeah, I heard some really good information today. One of those things was to set aside a little fund that so you already know, like you know what your experimental fund is gonna be. That's good and idea. then there's no stress associated with sort of when that money leaves because you're experimenting and that money leaving is way as I guarantee it's gonna be cheaper than like Gary said bringing somebody in, hiring them, giving a computer desk, blah, 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 blah. So let's try this online marketplace stuff like Gary represents and, and just spend the money and spend it, like Tim said, experimenting a little bit. So you, you've, you've set aside the right dough, you get to learn from that. That's kind of what Tim does when he goes to Vegas. He sets yeah. aside that pool. Right, and, right. You know. and then nowhere to fun. hold them, nowhere to fold them. <laughs> and uh, the, the other thing I would say is people are often stymied by choosing something to outsource or delegate because I think they get wrapped up also in this term outsource and they think of like Bangalore or India and they're like, but I'm not making textiles, but I don't need a spreadsheet, like what should I do? Anything that can be done via phone or via computer can be sent to someone digitally and uh, as a proof of concept for that, you can do things that have nothing to do and I would encourage you to do things that have no effect to your business bottom line. So it's like I, I outsourced my dating at one point um, that was and, a popular post and found on the and found teams around the world that got performance bonuses. There was like a request for proposals. It was very business like, but it was for something that had nothing to do with my business, and it was fun. How'd that work out for you? <laughs> it actually worked out really well. It was depressing though. It worked out for half the people you know, that worked I, for I, you. I was, in, I, I was in San Jose, nicknamed Man Jose for good reasons, and. Um, <laughs> It was enlightening and depressing that I actually ended up with a long-term girlfriend out of that, whereas all my previous attempts, like going out to bars and doing dinners and all that had failed. And I was like, I'm either really bad at that or like really good <laughs> at some other insight. Program, right? So there you go. One weekend and a bunch of, uh, a bunch of teams and uh, got a girlfriend out of it. <laughs> and a television show, I bet, too. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> Uh, you think that uh, satisfactorily answered that question? I believe it did. That was awesome. Thank you very much. Great, uh, Russ. And by the way, have a conversation. Um, don't need to talk to me. Just have a little conversation amongst yourself when, uh, when you're answering the question. I'm just a guy. I'm just answering the questions here. <laughs> Who you is guys that guy? are the smart people. You guys why are the smart there, why people. Why is there a strange man talking to us? Right? <laughs> exactly. So I'm going to read another question here, but the I just want to remind the audience that's that great. you guys have an opportunity I'm to I'm not going to call on Russ. I'm going to call on the person in the back row. I think that's a great idea. I just had a... Stand up. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, I was empathizing with the asker of that question, and I think there's also this component of sometimes you don't know what to do or you're worried about you're going to step on a legal boundary or something. Um, so something that came to my mind was LegalZoom has really cheap hourly uh, legal advice from actual lawyers. Like, they can't give legal advice, but they can hook you up with one. 
Uh, maybe you guys have other uh, tools that people might look at when they're not sure if they're going to step on a boundary. Ooh. Legal advice? Not necessarily legal specifically, yeah, but so sometimes the fear or like being unsure what the first step is or what you're allowed to do, what your limits are. And it's a slightly different question or slightly different tool set perhaps than what we've talked about. Yeah, well, can you, I guess the response that I have, if I do understand the question, is what can you do that's close to that that you can clarify that is not in the bound of legal and high stakes? So like something that's more risky than designing a logo for a birthday party, but not getting legal advice on intellectual property, for example. So I push right up to that line a little bit, check your comfort level. And then I will also sort of um, step back one, one little bit and say, I think it's much better to have a lawyer that you know and trust. And it's better to find the person that's it's the right value for you in that same way, like experiment with a little pile of money where you know, like because it's legal advice. And to bounce around and get like sort of ad hoc legal advice can be risky to your business. So I would prefer, uh, my recommendation would be to actually find someone that understands what your budget is that you can clarify. I would try and avoid paying a retainer to start that relationship. Start ad hoc a little bit, test out a, fo a few folks, and then find someone that you really like. I don't know if you guys want to touch on that or not, but. Well, specific to legal stuff, uh, I would say, because I, I work with a lot of lawyers, but. Uh, the first would be there, there are things that you need legal advice for, and then there are some things you need a legal template for, and those are two very different things. Uh, so I think price shopping for lawyers is often like price shopping for a neurosurgeon. You just don't really want to do that because you will end up paying for it later. <laughs> and uh, that having been said, uh, I, and somebody on the internet can fact check me here, but I believe, uh, so Automatic, you know, Tony Schneider, huge company now, Matt Mullenweg, uh, who's one of the lead developers of WordPress, did his initial incorporation with documents on LegalZoom. <laughs> okay, so it's like you don't have to be super, super fancy in the beginning. And the fact of the matter is, yes, you can pay a lawyer $750 to do a bunch of, of nebulous work, which is really just grabbing a document, doing a search replace, and then sending it to you. Uh, but when it comes down to uh, negotiations, for instance, there are cases where you want a powerful law firm or a well-respected uh, law firm because people are less likely to abuse you in that negotiation if they feel there, there are consequences with other clients that law firm represents, for instance. Okay, so the, there are a lot of factors to take into consideration that way. Yes. Uh, there was a question that was right next to you. Yeah, let's go ahead and send that microphone back. Hi. Tell um, us a little bit about yourself. And yeah. My name is Maggie. and. Um, First, I'll just say the last few days have been really amazing. Um, I've gotten so much out of it. Um, I come with 20 years of experience um, in a lot of like <laughs> big name <laughs> firms like Schwab, Wells Fargo, Barclays Global Investors, where in those big firms, I have built teams and managed people and projects and things like that. My heart, I believe, is in Silicon Valley. Like that's where I live. Those are the kinds of things I um, am interested in. I read in my spare time, things like that. What advice would you give to someone like me who wants to make a transition later in life? Into? Into, um, so um, as an example, I read a lot about technology and about companies who are looking, you know, moving from they just want to build a product to that next phase. And I feel like I could bring my experience and come help them. But how do you identify those opportunities when they're like just 50 people and you don't have that social network. No, I get it. Mika, this is for you. Yeah, that's a good question. So I think that uh, it's, it's, I think your question is a good one because sometimes it is tough to break into an industry. It's really, really hard. And actually, I wrote that one post though. I just get in, I said, it's like, I, I really believe that you've got to just find whatever road you ha can make. And I think the best way in Silicon Valley, like anywhere, I think, is if you can just, you know, whatever way you can do to help out people or companies. And so it could be just in the most minor way because your skill set, you're like, you know, you met somebody and they need some help. It's basically you have to work for free often in the beginning or volunteer or you might work even, it could be even like a, a nonprofit that you're working for and through that you meet people. So you just need to find a way to meet the right people. And so I think being as social as possible is very, very important. Um, but I also think that you, if, if you hear about something and you feel like, oh, I have just that little bit of skill, just find a way that, in a very non-threatening way, I think, you know, a lot of times there are a lot of people trying to eager to get in, you get, people, people get panicked, and so the, the best way to do is like, oh, I have this little skill, can I help you out with this? 
And through that, hopefully they'll go, wow, they don't know what they're doing, and you know, you'll stick to the next step, and the next step, and the next step. But you just have to get in in some way. And like I said, it could be through you know, children's schools, it could be through nonprofits, it could be through volunteering, it could be just, just start somewhere, and once you started there, then you can move on to the next thing. Um, and I think once you're in in some way, then you can expand that role. So I think that's the, but the hardest part is getting in, and I think that's where it becomes just trying to be social, just trying to meet people and find some way that, oh, and it may not be the perfect thing. The first thing you do, you might go like, you know, I really hate this. This is a kind of a crappy thing. But you're at least in closer, and from there you can expand to get to the next place. And yeah. you're getting that experience. I, and I would say that, and Mika, you probably, the same is true for us as well. We have open recs right now, which we can't find enough talent. Yeah. Right? So companies want this. They want great people who have specific skills, and they're looking for A players who can really deliver value and make an impact. So there's no shortage of demand. Right? So good supply is, in fact, needed. And just one other piece of guidance on this. I think that if you were to sort of draw three concentric, not concentric, but three overlapping circles to make a Venn diagram, what do you like doing? Right? So what is that you like doing? Number two, what are you really good at? You may like doing something, but not be that good at it. Like, I like playing tennis. I'm not that good, right? Um, so what are you good at? What do you like doing? And then is it a big market, or is there a demand for that thing? And if you can sort of sit down and define those and come up with the list, then I think it might help you to hone in on the companies that are looking for that. Right? So try and find the overlap of what you're good at and what you want to do, and is it big, then can you hone in on the companies that are doing that thing or need that thing. At least it gives you a starting point. That's a good point. I think if you can figure out like 50 companies, that's a lot that might be you're interested in, and then you can go on their web page. Our, our website has all the jobs that are listed and start looking there. And then you realize, oh, wait a minute, Creative Live, has a job I'm looking for. Oh, I, this guy. And then you need to contact the right person somehow. But I think that's the other thing is using LinkedIn, whatever kind of social way you can to find your way to get a good contact of the company. Because I think blindly sending a resume is not always the best way. So you need to have some way to get in there. So I think you're right, though. You just, you just need to figure out like what are your, where's your competency and what you want to do and then, and then really start doing some research. But it makes you a better fit for that opportunity because then you're all in on that. Instead of spreading it 50 places, you're like, no, 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 no. Creative Live, that's for me because I love, I can get excited about the mission, I'm, I'm a great writer, they need my content, I'm great, at, you know, whatever it is, you can, you can sell yourself into that opportunity better, I think. I think, yeah, I think that is really a crucial distinction is like spreading a wide, thin net is, you're going to be less passionate, you're going to carry less passion in the conversation and good recruiters, good hirers, they can smell it. Do you actually care about it? Are you in it for a J-O-B? And it doesn't sound like you're, you've had a lot of good, good career moves. So if like it really comes down to making those sort of Venn diagram, little gut check in here. What do you actually want to do? And I think start there first, because there are companies that are hiring for what you're good at that are in the space that you're passionate about. It's just a matter of through some sort of deduction. But I would say it's also just. Get in the door a little bit. Yeah. Once you're in the door, then yeah. you can expand it. So sometimes oh, it's not going to be your perfect job. Absolutely. And <laughs> just get in, and once you're in, then you can move around. I also have to. I, I have to I have get to on the bus. Get, yeah. On, yeah. Get, get on, on the, the bus, bus, even if you're the yeah. bus driver, or if you're the if you're the guy who's sweeping or gal who's sweeping the bus. Just get in. And I think there's other thing that, which is that it you need an introduction from someone. You know, Reed Hoffman said that's the number one way. That, that's basically the only people that read. Who if, you know, you've got to be familiar with Reed Hoffman. Is he's the the uh, co-founder and executive chairman at LinkedIn. Um, they call him, he's got the Midas touch here in Silicon Valley as an investor as well. It's very, his network is very hard to penetrate, but if it comes from a trusted source, he will take that phone call, take that email. So that's, that's similarly applies here. I want to underscore one thing that Mika said, and that is uh, volunteering. So wor working for free is extremely important. Uh, if you do not have the current contacts that you want to have, or just the peer group that you want to have, right? Because you're the average, let's say, of the five people you associate with most. I built my network when I first got to Silicon Valley by volunteering for two organizations, the Silicon Valley Association of Startup Entrepreneurs, SVASE, <laughs> very catchy, and uh, Thai, so the Indus Entrepreneur, because I'm clearly Indian. And uh, <laughs> uh, both very influential organizations with fantastic speakers. And I started at the bottom of the food chain and just did twice as much as they expected me to do, which as a volunteer gets you promoted to do more free work. And eventually ended up uh, volunteering to run one of their major events or main events, which meant that I got to pick the speakers, coordinate with the speakers, spend time with the speakers. And some of those people, this is in 2000, I'm still friends with. 
And one of them, Jack Canfield, co-creator of Chicken Soup for the Soul, was the one who ended up making the introduction to my Your then, book. yeah, my my soon-to-be agent in 2004. Uh, so it's I think it's really critical to not only develop a network like that, but if you're having a tough time figuring out like what you really want to do, what you're really good at, try to find people that you feel are worth emulating. And you're like, you know, like that life, not just the job, but like that life that they have is something I would like to emulate, something I can see really be being passionate about, and then deconstruct the path that they took to get there. Take that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good All one. Right. Let's have another question, not from the Insta audience. Let's just go back to the internet if we can for a second. Absolutely, we sure can. We have Sean Columbus, whose Twitter handle is at Kemsarov. says, I'm a partner in a consulting firm. We're doing well, but the problem is that as we bill on an hourly basis, we can't scale our revenue without working more hours or adding more people. How can we create growth without growing our headcount? What kind of other revenue streams should we look at? Good question. I think that's that's there's largely a product idea in there, and I know someone who scaled uh, a product to be able to connect lots of different people. Gee, I'm struggling with this one. You know, like a lot of times when the product is you, you have to figure out how to scale it. I think Tim has done an exceptional job of that, and pr could probably come at it from a different angle. But um, you know, when I think about, well, let's see, how do you how do you make more money for your business? You either have to charge more, right? You have to get more clients, or you have to sell different products, right? So you have one product, you have to add another product line. You have to charge more for the product you're delivering. The only way you can charge more is to either add more value, right? Um, uh, yeah, or get more clients who will give you, give you more money. I think in a consulting business it's tough because the only way to scale those is in fact to add more people. So um, yeah, I, one of those three, right? So either add more products to the bag, add more people, or get leverage. Right? Can you can you still charge your clients the hourly rate, but get leverage? You know, recognize that your expertise is in fact either in the maybe in the project management of it. You know, these are how big consulting businesses scale. Right, like McKinsey, they end up hiring lots of people in, teach them to do what they can do at very high quality, very repeat repeatable. Create more partner layers. That's what law firms do. So I think scaling a service business, you know, unfortunately, that's the nature of the beast. Right? You either have to bring in more people or... Something uh, tells me that Tim yeah. Ferriss is going to be able to add a, uh, another idea to that. Because <coughs> uh, well, you're the product, right? So you, how do you scale yeah. yourself, right? Cloning. Yeah. No, <laughs> I... He gets so, free work. By the way, I was going to say, Tim says go and work for free and volunteer. He's hiring. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm amazing free benefits. <laughs> uh, I would say that this, just due to the format of what we're doing right now, it's, it's tough to give an all-inclusive answer. So I'll just point, I'll, I'll suggest three resources in this particular order. Uh, number one, there's an ebook that just came out. It's free by a company named FreshBooks, which is an incredible company out of Canada. Uh, and it's called Breaking the Time Barrier. It's exactly about how to scale a service business uh, and scale it without adding headcount in order to do so, uh, nor multiplying your hours in order to multiply your income um, in a one-to-one -one, uh, ratio. So Breaking the Time Barrier, you can download it for free, number one. Uh, number two, the E-Myth Revisited, which is also uh, sort of an expanded discussion of how to scale service businesses or should you be in a service business to start with. Uh, that's number two. And then number three would be a book called Small Giants. And it's about companies that choose to be the best at what they do as opposed to the biggest. And I think that before we ask, how can I scale, the question might be, do I want to scale? Mm -hmm. Should I scale? Or should I just be the absolute best, charge 10 times what anyone else charges and deliver the best product? Uh, so there's, there are a lot of options there. But those would be the three resources I'd recommend. Probably. I think actually you guys both nailed it, but Gary, uh, it's it's uh, applicable to creative lives. So you know we want to grow this business, and the way we're doing it is that um, we're adding more classes, more workshops, lots of more products. Mm -hmm. We just double the output yeah. by our new joint here. And yeah, double out. the output here. Uh, and uh, number two is we are trying to grow the audience. And we're trying really hard to make sure we have a bigger and bigger audience. That's 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 the customers in this mm -hmm. case. Yep. Um, and, uh, but the, the third is we still had to hire more people. We had to hire more people. And I think, we, I think a lot about it, like how do we make sure that as we're growing that we don't just keep throwing people at it as we, because otherwise everything, the costs go up, yeah, the audience goes up and the you know, revenue goes up, but everything's going up. Whereas we've been fortunate, we've been profitable 
uh, the last few years, and that's because we've managed to kind of keep those in a good ratio. So I think this idea of scaling um, is, is an important thing. And I think one thing that we're trying to do, and I think a lot of software companies, which doesn't really apply to what this person's asking about, is that we're building a product that's going to uh, cause engagement where people will actually will contribute things to the Creative Live courses in some way. So we're trying to build a product that actually uh, allows people to come and that's, that'll scale. And that's, that's a very software kind of solution. If you build a solution that, I'm sure you know, that's what you guys do, is you, and that's what a Silicon Valley thing is, that you, you try to find a technology solution that allows more customers to come in without you having to add more people to support those customers. Well, actually, it, it's relevant to us because in the early days, Odesk, you know, we created this platform for finding and matching, then managing and paying, and we were very high touch. Essentially, we were really like a service organization. We think of us almost like an internet-based staffing firm with some technology for managing and paying those workers, but we were very high touch. We spoke to every client, we spoke to every contractor, we kind of hand matched and we had this little technology platform in the background. And we realized very quickly that that wasn't going to be a scalable business. We were, in fact, a service business. Mm -hmm. If you have to touch every client and you have to be hands-on and be the one throat to choke, and instead we took a step back and said, wait a second, if we were more like a platform, we, at that point we shifted and decided to be more like eBay. Right? We're not going to be in the middle of the transaction. We're going to enable clients to find and match themselves, to manage it themselves and pay themselves, and because we're not going to be in the middle, we're going to actually have to charge less, right? We were charging 30%. Why? Because we were very hands-on. We were in the middle. We were earning 30%. As soon as we stepped out, we now could only charge 10%. So imagine seeing your revenue go back more than a year, right? I mean, we took a steep decline. Revenue's going like this, and all of a sudden, it dropped. But once we did that, our revenue went like this, right? We created a different product. And so it's one way that we decided to scale our business, we pivoted to make the product less about us and more uh, a platform or more technology. So, uh, which isn't easy to do, by the way. I'm not recommending that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not an easy way to. Uh, it's not an easy thing to do. I'm just gonna to oh, oh, yeah, go sorry, for it. Sorry, sorry, I just no can't problem. contain myself. I just realized I don't know what o, the O and O desk stands for. What does that stand for? Well, it's zero oh. or no. Uh, originally, our our uh, first logo was a globe. So it's like a world desk, no desk. And you know what we believe is that work is not a place. You don't necessarily okay. need a desk. You just need to access to online. You just need a computer, and that could be at the coffee shop, the beach, and, and it's anywhere. Silent. Yeah. And no desk. And the, the, yeah, yeah, and yeah, it turns out that you don't want to have no in the title of your uh, the GN is yeah. silent. Right. Naming your company no yeah. something is not that good. So it's uh, zero desk, no desk, global desk. Uh, I'm just going to dovetail with what Tim Tim said, and that is. Uh, you have to ask if you actually really do want to scale. I think there's this, it's, it's very much an American idea for one. You know, a lot of global businesses, you've spent a lot of time living abroad, uh, Mika, and you know that it's like, what, what do you expect to get? You may know the story of the fisherman who's uh, uh, a rich American goes down, uh, the story goes down to Mexico, and he hires this guy to fish, and he's out of fish, and they're having a great dime. They catch a lot of fish, and the whole time they're fishing, it's like, oh man, you could scale this. You could, you could, um, you know, hire more people. You could catch more fish. You could have a whole fleet of boats. I can fund you. We can turn this into a great deal. And the guy says, you know, well, why would I want to do that? It was like, cause if you had a lot of people working for you, then you could take time off. You could sit there and you could wait for some silly gringo like me to come up and and uh, hire you. And it's like, well, that's essentially what you just did. So, and he he didn't actually have to scale it at all. He had the life. That was the end that he was looking for right now. He just didn't realize it. So uh, I took some advice from this weird book I read called The 4-Hour Workweek, um, <laughs> in which I applied the 80-20 rule. Witchcraft, be careful. <laughs> in which I apply, uh, applied uh, Pareto's law, which is the 80-20 rule. And uh, at the end of, so prior to being deeply involved in Creative Live, my entire livelihood was as a photographer and a director, which also doesn't scale. You're the talent, you're the people, that, you're the person that someone wants to talk to, hire, vision, Etc. It's like at the end of every year, I had to look at the clients. Who on that list was awesome to work with? Who did I get a ton of value? Who provided 80% of the value with only 20% of the headaches? And I wouldn't, when other clients called, I wouldn't say, I hate you, never call me again. I would just be, oh, I'm busy. And I'd focused and trimmed to the, to the, to the group that I wanted to serve. And in that world, I was able to continually elevate my prices. And you think that you could price yourself out, and you probably can, but you can also find a way to create a niche for yourself where there is almost no ceiling. Mm -hmm. 
And if you work with the right people and you get recommended within that network, you would be very surprised. And scaling might not actually be something that's required. So yeah. you could probably add some wisdom yeah. to that, but I think we should move on because we all hammered that one like yeah. four times. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm getting a lot out of this. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> Do we have any questions in the audience? Yeah, any, any studio audience questions? I know they're coming in from the internet. They but definitely are, but if we've got anyone in here. Okay, we'll go to the internet then. Yeah, Thanks for us. Okay. So, we have one from Nicola in Isla Vista who says, my company makes handmade artisan craft items, gift baskets, small housewares, etc. I started the company because I love making things, but it's getting to the point where I spend most of my time on things like negotiating with suppliers, managing employees, etc. Net result is that I don't get to spend much time actually making things anymore. Do I just need to accept the fact that I don't get to be hands-on anymore? Should I scale back or what? See question number one from the panel. Right? We, yeah. we already took that question. I'd say, yeah, uh, Emith revisited and then uh, Small Giants. Odesk, all these guys. Yeah. These okay. guys can help, I think. Uh, so if you're watching live and you missed the first answer, I, I don't know what to tell you if I have to go buy the product. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, since we already answered that one we similarly, on. I, think we should, I think we should push on if you're Sounds okay great. with that. I know we've got a lot of questions. So. We sure do. How do you deal with the temptation of growing before you fully tested your idea in one market? That is a great idea. You want to try that one? Sure. Um, I think that there, you know, high growth or uh, or going after uh, a high growth model is is incredibly risky. First of all, <laughs> yeah. uh, but having said that, though, if you have confidence in it and if you think that there is a way to go after it in terms of your um, funding or some way to sustain it, because high growth tends to mean, in my mind, it means um, you know getting ahead of the revenue often. It's, it's like you're, you're growing fast, which means you have to live a lot of costs. You have a lot of costs to, to go after it. I think that the, uh, the key is to have a strong stomach um, and have a lot of confidence in what you're doing, but also be ready to look out for, for uh, you know, it's basically set a few metrics for yourself saying, if I make this, then I'm gonna go do this, if I'm gonna do this. So be very rational going into the high growth because high growth can also, you can also can get myopic once you're in that kind of high growth trajectory in a business. And so I, I personally, like in this company, other companies, I've always had my own kind of personal metrics and see where we're going that it will allow me then to make a kind of a check and balance. Because once I'm there, it's, it's sometimes it's hard to realize what your goals were at the time. That's why it's important for companies to have things like budgets and forecasts and metrics. As you know well, from we have all these things, because we really have to, have to be honest with ourselves, what are we trying to achieve? I think that's important in a high growth situation. You know, I think uh, focus is really important. Having um, ridden over the cliff with one business because we got too distracted by too many shiny objects, uh, it's really dangerous. And I used to work for Reed Hastings, who's the CEO of a little uh, company called Netflix. And Reed said that 90% uh, of CEOs underfocus and 10% overfocus, and neither is good, right? <laughs> and so I think it's really hard. And he prides himself on being an overfocuser, right? Like. Let's not, that's probably not a word, but you know what I mean, I'm being over-focused. So um, we were talking about um, you know, all the opportunities and all the paths that they could have taken. And he told me a story that when uh, Blockbuster started competing with them online, they started looking at their competitive response. And so they started investing, or they started piloting a kiosk. So think of this, like a little, like these little cappuccino boots or whatever you drive through, and they said, you know, we can, we'll, we'll have a kiosk, we can put 10,000 titles in there, uh, we're going to design, it's going to look like this, it's going to be painted red, and we're going to go pilot six of them around the country. And he said, every second that we spent on kiosk was a second we weren't focused on online DVD rental. And it was a distraction. And they woke up a year and a half later and said that was a waste of time. They didn't need a competitive response because the future wasn't on premise, it was, right? And they were willing to seed that. And so I think that it's really important to stay focused on your core, because if you get too distracted, you try and be all things to all people to grow, you can lose sight of your core market and implode. Now with that, I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, I'd rather burn out than fade away, right? Like if you're plodding along and you're not swinging for the fence, well, guess what? Time is, is a limiting reagent, and I'd much rather burn, burn out than fade away. So with that said, you gotta make some bets on the future, um, but you gotta be careful not to make too many, so. Um, well and it's really hard to get it perfectly Great. right. And yeah, the well, gold, well said. Totally the agree. The Goldilocks CEO. Yeah. The, uh, uh, what I would say, I would just add one thing, and that is study the failures. Study the massive growth story failures because it's very easy to get romanced by success stories, and there's a huge survivorship bias. 
you read about all of these amazing success stories with companies that threw caution to the wind and piled money into something they weren't sure was going to work, and sometimes that turns out to be the case. It's often tr it's also true with the sort of romantic uh, romantic stories told about college dropouts. Also very similar, but like Study Web Van, you know, look at some of these companies that had spectacular implosions. Uh, because of an overaggressive growth strategy. And I think that that's useful to temper the impulse to believe that like fat, bigger, faster uh, is better at all times, uh, which is a very American, I mean, it's, not, it's a bit of a global thing, but it's a particularly it's, it's American more globalized, ethos. But yeah. Yeah. And then make an informed decision, but study the, the train wrecks. It's a fine balance between high growth and then, but not too high growth. I yeah. That's, that's, that's my answer. I like your focus, though. That's, 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 that's my favorite mantra. Yep. All right. So we have at Ben Latz, Ben yeah, Latz on Twitter, says, what are your views on high school entrepreneurs? We're starting to see people get started earlier and earlier. Would you mentor or invest in them? Is that something where age influences how you invest in a business? Well, I'm still in high school, so I'll take that question. <laughs> <laughs> I have the maturity of a high school. <laughs> oh, then let's we'll actually go kick it to you, because maturity is more important than real reality. Go ahead, take it. Here's no, we have to go. I have an answer. So Please, I, that sounds great. I actually saw uh, someone yesterday, a, a friend, uh, actually it was he and his wife and his son, who was accepted to Berkeley, and he decided not to go to Berkeley because he decided to do a startup. So he's 18, basically a high school senior, and he decided, I'm going to do a startup. And his reasoning was, look, you know, people go to college because that's kind of fun and exciting, because I think a startup is a lot more fun and exciting. So, you know, for him, like, the interesting thing was to do a startup. And, and, I, and I looked at him, and I heard his startup idea, and I listened to it, and I thought, wow, that's, you know, that's a, it's a pretty good idea. And he's a super smart kid. He's very poised. He's great. But I also look at it, and I go, hmm, I, I feel that, you know, maybe this is my European coming out, that life is so rich. And I'm someone who actually has had small companies my, my entire career. Like, I literally, when I was 13, I had a small business. I've always had something. But at the same time, I feel like the richness of life actually has made me who I am. And so maybe not necessarily just always going full bore, and I think college has that ability. So I, I, was, I was hesitant. Now, having said all that, there's also, you know, we had uh, Dale Stevens teach on Creative Live, and he was actually around yesterday. He has something called the Uncollege. And Dale uh, you know, is the first winner of uh, Peter Thiel's Don't Go to College $100,000 Grant Award. And he basically, when he did it three years ago, and I think he started something called the Uncollege, and he'll, he talked to Dale, which I did yesterday. Um, he was just like, you know, he's, he's vehement. Do not go to college. Everyone in high school should start businesses and everything else. I, I just don't think, I'm like, I, hate to, I hate to be, you know, I hear him, but I'm like also, you know what, life is so rich, and I think that can also, by having all kinds of other experiences, that may inform your business idea. But again, I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle on all this because I think if you're just so passionate, you gotta do it, you gotta do what you do. I think following your passion is such an important thing, and if you have that kind of um, resources even to start a business, and you know, college is expensive, but starting a business is also not cheap, so. Yeah, we just, um, we just ran a big survey uh, um, we went and surveyed clients, right? People are trying to get work done. We surveyed contractors. We found some really interesting statistics. 72% um, of people, uh, clients on our uh, platform, who have a regular job uh, want to quit that job in the next two years. 72% want to quit. 61% said they're likely to quit. Can I use those statistics in a future talk? Because I, really, yeah. I love yeah. those data. 61% yeah. okay. are likely to quit. Why? Well, because they're not happy with what they're doing, right? They want this freedom and flexibility. They yeah. want purpose, autonomy, and mastery. We talked about it earlier with uh, Guy Kawasaki. Uh, Dan Pink writes about this. And so they're not fulfilled. And so entrepreneurship is not how many businesses have you started. It's a mindset. And that, this mindset is shifting. Do you know there's more than 10,000 courses uh, in US colleges now on entrepreneurship, up significantly from five years ago? Because there's this mindset out there. There's these high school kids that want to start businesses, and the leading universities are saying, hey, wait a second, we, we need this, right? We need these courses. I've spoken to a dozen schools in the last couple of months on the very topic. So I think there's this shift that's happening. And no longer is it about where you went to school and what classes you took. It's what are you capable of, right? People have to take control of their own brand, and they have to um, start building a book of business. Our VP of marketing, her daughter just got hired and she said, you know, it's amazing. Nobody asked me for my transcripts or uh, they want to know that I graduated from NYU, but they don't care about what classes I took. They want to know about my internships. She worked at Food Network. She had a great internship there. She had another one somewhere else. That's all the questions they wanted to know. So 
It's Should a high school student uh, start a business? So you're the, it's the sum of your experiences, and I say absolutely, they should start a business. But I'm not, you know, my kids are going to college. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, but, but I think I college is yeah. different. And the learners of today, and one other statistic, the, the, the learners of today will have 10 jobs by the time they're 40. 10 yeah. jobs, that's a, that's a job every two years, depending on if you graduate from college. Well, you're speaking to the converter. Your creative life is all about yeah. skills-based learning. Yeah. You're teaching skills that you can apply. So that's, yeah. that's exactly Yeah, so right. I think people should find what they're passionate about, and they should go get educated on those things. So if you're really excited about photography, I don't know that you need to go to college for photography. You should go take a course on photography and learn how to do it, and then get practical experience, because I think Tim said it earlier, you may find out that you don't even like that thing, right? You've, you've, and boy, I'd rather find out now than invest four years of my life uh, in it, so, so I've, I've some thoughts on this just because I I, uh, I go back to 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 teach a class on high tech entrepreneurship twice a year at the college level, and I spend a lot of time with high school entrepreneurs via the blog, uh, you know, a couple hundred thousand at least, um, and I would say a few things. <clears throat> so I, I think that you have your entire life to be an adult and to make money, and if you feel like you have to capitalize on one idea, that is the idea you're probably not gonna succeed because as an entrepreneur, you, be, you need to be able to create opportunities. Uh, same issue with like inventors who don't wanna tell anyone about their invention, they want everyone to sign an NDA, they're gonna fail anyway, so they should just quit and do something else. I mean, seriously, that's kind of my, my feeling about it. Uh, I would say also, there are, I, I have met, and this is not always the case, Dale is an, is an exception, but I have met people who view college as a vehicle for preparing them for a job. I do not view a liberal arts education as having that function. I think it is to create a well-rounded human being. Yep. Okay, so I have met people who have started companies very early because they felt internal, external pressures to do that, and they're phenomenally financially successful and phenomenally one-dimensional. You can't talk to them about anything other than what they do in the business sense. And I think that's a shame. Uh, I think it's kind of a tragedy. So what I would say is, if you are like possessed by some demon because you are that inspired about some business you wanna try, sure, you know, like go for it. If it's really that type of like driven by the universe, the only thing, even if startups weren't the hot thing, even if Mark Zuckerberg weren't on the cover of every magazine, I would still wanna do this. Even if we were in a nuclear winter of startup financing, I would still wanna do this, okay, fine. Uh, but otherwise, I would say, got your whole life to be an adult, uh, you know. And it's also a question of like first world versus third world, right? If you're in a if you're in a, a socioeconomic situation where you're in like Bangladesh and you're like, well, I could like fund myself going to college and then maybe I'll get a job like replacing hubcaps, and you have fantastic business idea, business idea, right? But if, if I'm like one of your kids, <laughs> it's like, well, like I could do like Brown or Harvard or Columbia or whatever. <laughs> I think, my, and my kids are in Bangladesh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, just, just, just some food for thought. I, I think education is not purely a vehicle to a larger paycheck. I yeah. agree. I, I think it, I'll just hijack that for a second and say, not is it just not a vehicle to a larger paycheck, but to a paycheck. Yeah. It's not a yeah. vehicle to a paycheck. No. And there's this narrative that we've been telling our, our kids, our uh, peers for several generations, which is if you grow up, you go to a great college, you're gonna get a great job. That, that narrative is still present. It's still the dominant narrative that we're telling our world, at least in the sort of socioeconomic circles that we participate in, largely in this room, uh, it was one that I participated in, but there is that uh, a belief that go to college, get a job. That narrative no longer is true. The un like the people who are doing the thing that they went to college for is at an all-time low, and that's that, that's unemployment. And underemployment is even ten or ten or eighteen percent lower than that. So I'm not as good at with stats as my man down there is, but generally speaking, I think it's time for us to to um, to take a new look at that narrative and decide for ourselves: is this something that it is going to school delaying something that we really want to do? And if it is because it's gonna provide a job or a resource at the end, I don't believe it. If you're going because it's gonna provide a wealth of human experience and you have the ability to do that, to sort of not be an adult, then I think that is, is, a, is an option. But it's not an either or, I think it's very, very individual. And I think as what we believe in Creative Live is the future is very skill-based and, and 
exploring that is a very good way of identifying if you want to do it or not. Because you might think, I want to be a photographer more than anything, and at 16 or 18 or whatever, you go do that thing, because it's a very low risk, you don't have any bills, et cetera, you know, to speak of, and you find out that, oh, wait, I don't get nights and weekends off, I, don't, like, I can't go out and play with my friends. Like, like, it's a great way of experimenting in a low risk, low value sort of way. So um, individual, it's, it depends on the individual and what these smart guys said for me. <laughs> well, and we Chase, do gentlemen, that time flies. It does. And I think we are about time to wrap up. Can I, I got Can one we, request. We one question one, yeah, here we didn't get Right to. here. Oh, there we go. So we're going to send work. him a... Um, All right, it's a good one. This, anyone says this is a good question, <laughs> I'm sitting Strong forward. close. <laughs> oh. Bring it on. Cody I'm sitting Kent, forward. Product manager in the Bay Area here. Uh, my question is, I love this idea of outsourcing everything, but what are some things that you love to do so much or you inherently think shouldn't be outsourced? Personal vision should never be outsourced. One, because it's personal. Two, because generally speaking, that, that is the thing that should differentiate you from all your peers. It, it, it's a culmination of your life experience. It's the way you see the world. And outsourcing that is sort of, uh, it, it's, I think it's anti-entrepreneurial, for one. Now, I'm going to put a slight twist on that. It's if you have a vision that you can merge with other really smart people and sort of leverage that, I wouldn't consider that sort of outsourcing. I would consider that sort of leveling up a little bit and put yourself around really, really smart, talented people. But vision and the thing that you believe in, is, is, it's, it's hard to, uh, it, for, for at least for me, it's hard to kick that thing to the curb. What do you guys think? You shouldn't outsource the part of what you do that you love. So even like Zuckerberg, he still codes because he loves coding, right? So I think that's a key thing. And I, I've talked to a lot of people who uh, are outsourced and they, they regret that they outsourced or they hired somebody to do the job that they really like to do. And then they're like, they're bummed out in their, in their company or their job because they're not doing what they really love to do. Yeah, especially if they're trying to scale their business and then they end up leaving the thing that is the thing that they wanted to do in order to be the scaler part of it. And then you find out, I've got this great scaled business that I know I'm not a manager, I'm not an X, I'm not a Y. I'm the coder, and I, I have, I'm 100 miles from coding. It's a real problem. Yeah. Tim, what do you got? I'm still gathering my thoughts. Do you have any? Okay. Yeah, I would say um, uh, do not outsource your dating. Don't ever do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. no, um, scouting. <laughs> yeah, scouting Different is story. good. Yeah, see, yeah. I think it's all that leverage, right? And it's about best and highest use. Making sure that you're, A, if you really love it, and B, if you're really good at it, right? And you like doing it, then you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't do that. The other things, you should try and get leverage. Um, but um, if you're good at it and you love doing it, then, uh, then you should keep it. Cool. Great. All right, and I think we've got one final question right here in the front row. Thank you. Um, one of the benefits that I've experienced um, with my experience here with Creative Live is that we were just having a really um, awesome conversation, Patrick and Carlo and John and I um, at the tables right before we came in. And um, I think that this is really important for the online audience to hear too. I have my own opinions because I'm actually a, a lawyer, a deal maker, and a negotiator myself. But my favorite quote is the Tim Ferriss quote that is, reality is negotiable. I love that quote. And um, I just wondered if any of you could speak um, basically on if you had any um, suggestions as to negotiations, techniques, and uh, how you get other people on the same page or close to the resolution that you're interested in? Uh, that's a really good question. Wow. I want to hear from this guy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but just one quick note, read uh, Derek Sivers' writing. Just a real quick, he founded CD, CD Baby, yeah. incredible programmer. Uh, he has a very short book that talks a lot about uh, answering your questions specifically. Yeah, okay, it's a good one, Fair worth right. rereading. Uh, I don't have a great answer. I, I feel that uh, the most successful negotiations are ones where both parties feel like they got something out of it. And I think that's just understanding the other party, what they're trying to do. And I, I've been in negotiations with, with Hollywood firms and uh, others that where it's like clearly it's, it's one-sided and you, 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 you walk away not feeling good. And you end up doing a negotiation that just makes you feel bad. And I'm always amazed that the other party made me feel so bad. Yeah. And so I try to go in there making, making sure that we're both going to get something out of it. If we're not, then we got to, something's wrong with the, the deal. Why are we making this deal if we can't get, yeah. figure it out? Um, and, but don't get me wrong, I've, I've been on the other side of the table where I've kind of you know, slammed something down someone's throat 
Not you, you were a pretty good negotiator. Because <laughs> he did a class for us. But he used a psychological tactic there. But uh, um, anyway, but it, it's, you know, you, you do that also. But I feel like I, I, the op optimal, and I think it's just understanding, you know, what they're looking for and trying to find those, those deal points. Because most negotiations have multiple deal points. And you, you can give on some things and just make sure everyone walks away, hopefully feeling. Because most negotiations aren't the end of the relationship. That's just the start of the relationship. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the worst thing, is if you have a bad relationship, what, what's then what's the point? I mean, you started your answer off saying you didn't have a very good answer. Now just, you're, <laughs> dropping, you're dropping tons of knowledge right there, especially with that last kernel. I think that's, <laughs> seriously. You know, Under-promising, over-delivering. <laughs> <laughs> As a former sales guy, I used to think that you know, your job is to negotiate a great deal for the company, and even at the expense of I win, you lose. And, you know, when I think back on some of those days, I made, just made so many mistakes. I feel badly about it today. You know what I mean? Like, we won and we're high-fiving because we negotiated so well. And in a personal scenario, I went to, we were going to buy a house, and we, uh, we were negotiating over the price. And the guy who was selling the house came back and raised his price. And I'm like, hey, that's not how you negotiate. What are you doing? Like, we, we're moving towards a closer. You're going there. He goes, yeah, the market moved. You know, and, and that's what, and I remember thinking, what an ass. You know, like just trying to maximize every last dime, and it just wasn't decent, you know? And so I think, as Mika said, it's the start of the relationship, and the very best are I win, you win. And one other thing is, have you ever seen this show on TV where these guys, they sell real estate? Oh, um, it's on Bravo TV. It's some million dollar listing. Is that what it's called? I was watching this on Virgin America. I'm flying, and they have the TV, and I'm watching this thing, and they... They're in a negotiation, and so to the camera, they're telling you the truth. And then to the guy they're negotiating with, they're lying to their face. They're saying, the maximum I can go on this house, my client won't go above a penny above two million. And the client, meanwhile, just said, I'll go to two, three. You know, and they're negotiating, and I'm like, they're lying. Like, don't lie, you know what I mean? So I just think transparency, honesty, win-win is, is the way to go. And, and, you know, when you walk away, both feeling like you won, it's magic. Yeah. So, so I'd say a few things. Uh, the, the first is, it's, <clears throat> the first is uh, distinguishing between positions and interests. So if someone has a very staunch position, they're digging in their heels, like that's their position. He can phrase it that way. Like, I understand your position, but like, what are your interests? Like, why do you have that position? And it turns out that things are very easily resolved oftentimes, where it's like, well, the guy, the reason that this, this family won't sell this land to this developer isn't because of the price, which is what he thought it was, is because they, they associate it with their son yeah. who was killed in the war, and, and so the developer says, we'll erect a statue to your son, and this and that, and they're like, okay, got it, done. And they, you have, that often comes from digging one level deeper, deeper. I will say a few other things. The most interesting, long-term, profitable and enjoyable deals I've ever done have always come after developing, having a human, exchange, a, developing a human connection with the other person. So it's like, tell me about where you grew up. Like, what sports did you play? What's that, the hell does that tattoo mean on your wrist? You know, like, all this kind of stuff where you get a little more color and get a, a better feel for the rapport that you could have, not just at the close, but like two, three, four, five years down the line. Um, and very closely related to that is uh, two things, and we could go on and on about tactics, but I think these are a few of the most important. When people expect you to pitch something or to negotiate, they brace themselves for the sell, right? So they're like, he or she is going to propose this, and then I'm gonna counter with that. And often what I will do is I'll almost convince them not to do the deal. I'll be like, you know, like this isn't, this type of thing isn't for everybody. Like if you fit in this category, this category, or the product of this fits in this and this, it doesn't make any sense. Like I can't help you, like as an advisor, right? If I'm talking to companies, I'm like, I can't help you with like this, 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 or this, or this, or this. However, like if, it's this or this, then we should talk. And like maybe it makes sense, maybe it doesn't. So being very low pressure. And lastly is uh, like he or she who cares less wins. Always. And like he who cares less wins. So it's like when you, and oft sometimes that's an act, oftentimes it's because you know what your sort of BATNA is, your best alternative to negotiated agreement. You know your walk away and you know you'll be okay because maybe there's option A and option B but you figured out what option C is. Uh, that is the ultimate leverage. Sounds like your dating advice, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> since, since my peers, I feel like, said there's, there's a whole course on negotiation that was just presented by these, these folks, I'm going to try and say some things that are a little bit different. And one 
is there's a really interesting technique that I've been practicing lately, and of course it depends on the stakes, right? So everything is about the stakes, and if the stakes aren't low or are something that you can live, this idea of not negotiating at all, just accepting the first offer that comes, okay, that sounds good. And with the goal of, it's your, if you are thinking about it from a long-term basis, you can get in, have a relationship, do the thing you want to do, such that when the next round of negotiations come around, you carry the hammer. It's a really interesting approach. It depends on what those original stakes are, of course. Um, two other pieces of advice that are also, um, I feel like, different from my peers here, and they also don't work. They're highly nuanced. One is to have someone else negotiate for you. Yeah. That is the purpose of yeah. an agent. That is the purpose for years as a photographer and a director. Before I had agents and managers and stuff like that in that role, I would have to negotiate tooth and nail with these people to get an extra dollar. And then you know you sign the agreement at midnight, and then at, at 7 a.m. you show up for call, and the people that you were just bashing are you have to just like, hey, you want to get a coffee? Let's go. Let's get start the day. It's like it's so weird <laughs> to go from this combative, yeah. you know. And then there it creates a sort of a false. Um, uh, sense of, of a relationship where there was something that was there was bad blood there so um, try and have someone do that for you if it's possible if you know it's going to get a little bit rough and then at the complete other end of that spectrum I realize I'm all over the place but these you know let's try and talk about some outliers that have been effective at the complete opposite end is I've seen people negotiate over the phone and through lawyers and through all these mediators for a, you know over something for months and months and months they walk into a room and they can work it out in 45 seconds because there's a human being to human being you realize uh, like all this honesty really mm -hmm. comes out and you just because you know that you're both interested in getting the deal done so a simple connection with no one else around where you can just go human to human can sometimes work yeah last thing you can't do a good deal with a bad person doesn't matter what you negotiate doesn't matter what the contract says if you get that like spidey sense it's not gonna work out yeah. intuition is invaluable yeah. and with that I think we probably need to wrap up this session. How about a round of applause for my fine panelists here? Thank you very much, guys. Thank you.